Hi, I'm Bill Hunt, WM Hunt. Uh, welcome to uh, Unseen and Undiscovered. So, um, I'll give you a little backstory on some stuff that, uh, who am I? I'm someone who's been around photography for a long time. And this came up at breakfast this morning that when I turned 50 this spring, that's a joke. Um, anyway, I decided that I needed a life's mission. So I decided that my life's mission would be to promote the delight of photography. Uh, the part of my life in photography has been so fulfilling and fun and so that's why I do this stuff. That's why I show up and let's talk about talent, let's look at the pictures, let's be amazing. Uh, photography has provided me with a really, really exciting life. So happy to bring some other people on board. The history of this uh, event itself, the Phoenix Art Museum, once a year, their photo supporters committee, under the guidance of Becky Senf, who presented two days ago. Uh, Becky is the director, interim director and senior curator at the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, and a good, good lady. So once a year they invite some Yahoo to come in and talk about 10 photographers who they've encountered in the last year. And she delivers this ravenous audience who's just as the best audience in the world. So hopefully you could learn from them and really be excited by the possibility of this event. And talk about 10 photographers. And that's a good assignment because that PowerPoint does not exist in your computer and you actually have to do the work and put it together. But it's really, really fun. And at the end of that evening, they vote on a photographer and they buy a picture for the museum. Pretty cool. So I wanted to come to Unseen. I came the first year and I wanted to come back and I didn't want to pay. So I contacted Emilia and Anne, Anne Rutt, who organizes these things. Uh, and, they, and I pit, proposed that we do six people over three days, each doing a half hour with five photographers. And they went, I think for a long time they went, we have no idea what you're talking about. But then at some point they seem to get it and they go, okay, we'll do that. And then they further fixed it so it's not just new, emerging, it can be unknown. So in my five, there's one who's more unknown than he should be because I think he's a great photographer. And so I'm going to present, and then Christoph Kandrowitz from Poland, who has no body fat. You'll be impressed by that. He has no body fat because he works about 26 hours a day and is someday it's just going to stop and he's going to get all fat and ugly and it'll be horrible. But right now he's not. He's skinny and beautiful. Hello. So it's Bill Hunt, and here we go. Here's number one. Uh, I can never pronounce this name. It's something along the lines of Ozada Ak Aklore, Iranian. Uh, and I saw these uh, in a show in uh, Somerset House in London that Fariba Farshad had curated. Uh, great show about contemporary Iranian photography. And I saw these, and uh, they are recreations of events in Iranian, in Iranian history, usually assassinations or deaths or some dramatic moment, crisis. And in some instances, they're creations of the moment because there is no photographic evidence. So it's a p completely uh, unusual way of telling history. And they're very cinematic, colorful, she does lots of research, sets them up. She worked, she was a movie maker for many, many years. And so you get something like this, which is Evan Hills Tehran, which is, here you can read the title. There you go. And here we have uh, Atlantic Hotel Tehran, Olympic gold medal wrestler who was, who died, 1968. 
And one of the things that happens in these, this is, my, this is not my favorite, this is my second favorite. She's in these pictures sometimes, so it's like this Alfred Hitchcock presence. Hello, Stephen, thanks for coming. See, I told you I, I start on time. Uh, I like the completeness of the project, that she really stages it with lots of drama, and you can see it. I will say that they, these were at, at Arl last summer, and they didn't look good at all, because they were tiny prints. You just walked in the room and didn't even see them. So I'm not a big fan of big prints, but these were better, big. Uh, This is my favorite, because uh, it's an assassination student activist. And it's my favorite because it does a couple things. She really, know, she really knows her photo history, so you get, you get Robert Kappa's Falling Soldier, and you get even someone like Luke Delay, who has, works in the same panoramic format. Anyway, now you know about Azadeh, and um, this stuff still excites me. I can remember when I saw them, I went, oh my god, this is just so inventive. It's really photographic. The conceptual part of it results in a real picture. Uh, you can do other stuff as a conceptual artist, but I'm a real analog guy, so this makes sense to me. Um, now we've got a guy named David Fati, who's French, who spent his childhood in America, so his English is like better than mine. And at Arl last summer, he, he had, for me, the best installation of anybody, particularly because they had put him in a really, really squatty situation in this new old building that they'd started programming in, and there were two installations ahead of him, so you had to go through this maze to get to him. And you could, would have been very, very uh, proper in just saying, like, fuck this, these are awful. Sorry. Um, already, I just went right to the bad language right away. Um, so here's what he does. He, this is called The Last of the Immortal Woman, and this is the story of Henrietta Lack, who was an African-American woman who died of cancer, and they had harvested her cells, and this completely changed the scope of cancer research. They could never get cells, cancer cells, to live outside of the body. Hers did, and so suddenly they had this whole pool that they could get live cells from, and then do research, and so the tragedy is that she died, but that they then never acknowledged her financially or historically, and that's really s sad. Now, of course, they do movies. Oprah did a movie about her, and um, so this is the project he did, and he, um, it was all dark, and it's some pictures that he's fabricated. So there are these landscape pictures sort of that have this strange purple magenta ectoplasm hanging in the trees. And, you know, they're not particularly good. But they're really, you go, wow, what's going on? But what is really good, oh, you can't make this out. There's lots of text, and usually whenever you see text in a photography show, you go, well, I'm not reading that. But you do read this, and um, it's a very dark show. Um, he uses neon, and he uses some video, and it's impossible to read. It's about epiphanies. Uh, he says that he's sort of searching for the format for this, because 
very often the way he works, he'll do a book at the end. And I, I loved the theater of it. I had spent a really long time in it. A lot of time not knowing what I was looking at, but really feeling that if I gave it some time, he would deliver it, and I think that happens. And I don't know what it'll be ultimately. Man, these are dark. Sorry. So he did these two little books. This is called Wolfgang, and this is about like the unluckiest scientist ever, who's who is notorious for like screwing up experiments and losing things. And uh, this is based on forensic material and vernacular photographs and perfect. It's just a perfect, perfect book. And he's, he's a really, he's not invested in making the photographs himself. He just loves the world of photography and however you get there, he gets there. And then he has another book called Anecdotal. And this is about nuclear disasters. <laughs> I don't know why that's funny, because it's really like chilling when you read the book. And it's not like when they dropped the bomb. It's more about when they like lost the uh, uranium. <laughs> it was, you know, in some storage locker for six months. And they went, do you know where the uranium is? Uh, it has a, a, a nice relation to uh, Mike Mandel and evidence, which is kind of the classic use of vernacular photography. PhotoFest, four years ago, um, climate change. Is it four years ago or two years ago? Two years ago. So it's, it's this, 2018 is the next one. So, no offense, because there are PhotoFest people here. So you're in this big show, and it's all these glacier pictures that are gigantic, and they're all face-mounted plexi, and you go like, just save me from this shit. And so I'm going through it, and it's very thoughtful, and I'm looking, and there's this thing, that these little tiny pictures, these little black, pictures and brown pictures and they're like going come on over here and uh, this is these are two projects by uh, Roberto Ibanez um, uh, moments of uncertainty is the main one and what he does he'll take um, graphs of climate change price of gold things like that he'll photograph that and then he'll put the photograph, the silver print, in the dark room, and the emulsion comes up, and he moves, the, he manipulates the emulsion. So you get these very sexy, sen sensual revisions of economic and political history that are completely seductive visually. A thing happens that where the emulsions come off the white, the light, it's matte, so the light behaves differently than the light that's reflected off the silver print. So they're incredibly gorgeous. They're all unique. That kind of picture that you just want to dance around the room with because they're so special. And he spent his life as a chemist and, I guess, making pictures on the side. And um, that's what the original, uh, we have some examples. These look really good with all these huge color glaciers. And I thought engage, they, they were so engaging to me visually that I liked it. And he was a great, he is a great talker. I think they're very beautiful. And they're not very big, 16 by 20 framed about. Uh, also at Houston, two, four, four years before, four years ago. So this is a guy named Steve Sabella, who lives in Berlin, German, and he had 
what I would describe as very German pictures <laughs> in the German show made sense. You know, Michael Wolf kind of graphic compositions. Then he went, he gave a talk and he showed something that he'd been working on that uh, these are called 38 Days of Recollection. So he's, he's of Arab descent and he rented a house occupied by Jews in the occupied territory and the house that originally belonged to Arabs. I thought as he told the story, it was his childhood home, but it, it wasn't. But I like this layering of information. And so he went through the house and photographed things. I probably telling this inaccurately, but he did these domestic interior pictures. And then he went through and took paint and plaster chips from the house. He harvested those. Then he put photo emulsion on the paint and plaster chips and made those into photographs, photographic objects. And so they behave like these archeological discoveries. And I thought that was a real clever reinvention of photography and that it was a, a historical appreciation of something where he was inventing the history. They're good looking uh, in photographs. I've never seen one in person, but I like, I like the mindset. I thought this guy is worth paying attention to. So you can see pots and pans. At first, you don't notice the imagery, actually. They're in this book called Fragments. And then it's a wider career. He's an active image maker of many different projects. And that's in this book. So if you're looking at Steve Sabella, if I spent like three minutes, am I like doing this at my 90 miles an hour? Anyway, so my fifth person uh, is Gerald Soda. Gerald Soda lives in Patterson, New Jersey, and Gerald Soda changed my life. So I thought that was worth talk talking about. So 20 years ago, I got a, a presentation from a gallery that I'd never heard of about a photographer I'd never heard of who had gotten reviewed by Alan Coleman, A.D. Coleman, and he had written this review and it sounded like Jesus was in Soho making silver prints and you could go see him. So I went to this gallery to see the show and I can. Rem I showed up at this gallery and there was a post-it on the note that said, gone to lunch. And I went like, how, do you, how are you in an art gallery in New York City and you go to lunch? Anyway, I, I finally found them and I went in and looked at the work. And the work was then these black, big black and white one-offs, one always these expressionistic scenes of terror or some kind of a expressionistic instant that was staged and the print is, the negative is worked on, cut, and then he works on the print itself. He carves it and marks it. And my working description of Gerald was that it was like Joel Peter Whitkin without the intellect, very primal. And um, I really liked the work a lot. And I thought it was too expensive, which I reported to the gallery. One thing led to another, and six weeks later I was working in this gallery and had become an art dealer. And I think it was to get a hold of these pictures really cheap, which I did. And Gerald and I have collaborated on any number of things. I think he's endlessly creative. Actually, this is in my collection, as was the first one. It's just like crazy. So then the work, this, this to me is the, the rudest photograph ever made. It has a very, very, very naughty name, 
which I'll share with you privately, not, not in public. Uh, this just covers all the bases as far as I'm concerned. If you're gonna do a, a female nude, don't mess around, do it. So the working title sounds like constellation, because <laughs> it's kind of a constellation. Anyway, uh, he did his project after this about fairy tales, very bent, very, very bent. The girl playing Little Red Riding Hood was a softcore porno actress who was about 45. So it's a reconsideration of fairy tales. Uh, this is a project he did with a playwright named, uh, oh my God, Neil LeBute. And Neil LeBute is as transgressive as Gerald, and I always thought this would make a great collaboration. So, Neil would write a caption, and then Gerald would illustrate it. So that the caption on this one is, the baby stopped crying a few hours ago, but I'm afraid to go up and check. That's good, for me anyway. And uh, this one is, so look at the image, and this one is, some nights I slip inside my parents' bedroom to watch them sleep. If I'm very careful, they don't feel me sitting on the mattress. <laughs> so there's these dream-like, uh, aberrational pieces. Gerald used to ask me, so what are these? Is this like a portfolio, or what are we doing? And I, Aperture actually published them as a set of uh, images. There it is, in fact. Uh, but I always wanted to do them as bar napkins because I thought that was just the perfect manifestation of them. Because mostly Gerald sketches on bar napkins and I, know, I thought that was a way to do it. Uh, once upon a time I got a call from Kathy Ryan at the New York Times Magazine and she said, do you think Gerald could do a commission? And I went, so the first thing I thought was, no, <laughs> absolutely not. It just, it's just not gonna happen. So she's very imaginative. I said, give me a minute, let me call him. So I, I thought, I'm gonna have to call every bar in northern New Jersey to find him. But I found him in Woodstock and I said, look, the New York Times wants to hire you to do a commission and I have to know from you that you can do it. Otherwise, I won't in make the introduction. You have, I said, I will come break your kneecaps if you fail to deliver this assignment. And Gerald became Mr. Overnight for the New York Times. He'd get the assignment, he'd dress his dad up as a pedophile priest, throw it out of focus, and uh, he, he delivered some very imaginative pieces. And here's one. This had text over it. I can't think what this was. I forget. I can't think what it was. Anyway, I love Gerald. I think he's completely overlooked. This is this is a portrait of me that looks more like me than me. It's me on both sides, um, and at different times. So Gerald hasn't made a lot of money over the years, and at one point he was sort of starving and said. I need a job, so I commissioned him to photograph my cats. <laughs> so, so I gave him 500 bucks to come photograph the cats, and so I delivered these really good cat pictures. And the George Eastman House was doing a project about animals, so I donated them to the Eastman House and took the deduction and got the print. So it all works out and he's in the collection, and good for him. And then I was doing, I did, I've done a book that Aperture published, and Thames and Hud, Hudson published, and Actisude published, called um, The Unseen Eye, and it's a very, in, in all objectivity, it's a really good book about uh, life and collecting and how collecting is really good. So we restaged the cover of it, and that's me with my ass in the air hanging over the couch. 
But the new thing, so last year, he has a fan and a guy named Tim Wright, who's the curator at the Norton Museum in Palm Beach. And um, I was hanging out with Tim, and he said, do you think Gerald could handle a commission? And it was like the New York Times thing. I go like, uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 he could do it. So I called him up and I said, Gerald, I'm going to break your kneecaps again if you don't deliver on this. So the commission was to do something about the Everglades, because the Norton Museum's in Florida, and he was doing a, Tim was doing a big project on the Everglades. So Gerald, in three weeks, did I show it or delivered this, which is uh, about six meters high, six meters wide, and it's all, it's again, it's his dad in a, in a, uh, soldier's outfit, and it's the one war that was fought on U.S. soil where the white people lost. The Seminole Indians prevailed. So it's this funny little moment in American history that only Gerald would have rooted out. But I thought he delivered this piece that was such a great, great surprise and really a fulfillment of what a commission should do. Uh, so good for Gerald. Uh, so those are my five, and because I'm just, uh, I love photography, and I couldn't stop, I just wanted to share five other people with you who I think are under-recognized and should be known. And this is, uh, I judge a lot of competitions. I actually judged the Myberg here, which was fun to do. It's great. They, you know, they give you coffee and you look at a lot of pictures. And so this guy, Danilo Tchenko, does did these pictures in the Russian Forbidden Zone. Very, very white. I know you've seen these pictures, and other people have gone there. And every time I see the other people's pictures who have gone there, I go, why couldn't they do them like this guy? I, uh, I thought this was a great good-looking project, and it also exists in three dimensions somehow. They're the sculptures, I think. Right? Does that make sense? Anyway. Well, I like him. And then at PhotoFest, I do portfolio review, gladly, and I've had... Twice I've had the experience of having portfolios in front of me. And I've literally burst into tears. So, um, the, this is Takeishi Taka Ishikama. Uh, he does these port, uh, platinum prints of forests that are incredibly masculine. And I find platinum to be an incredibly feminine process. And he did these things that were incredibly dense. And for me, it, almost everything's really sexy for me. But these were incredibly sexy for me. They had this density. And the poor guy is sitting there, he doesn't speak any English, and his wife does speak English, and trying to tell them, like, the big white man will be done crying at some point. So don't worry, you'll get your 20 minutes. Just let me have my moment. And I tried to get him a gallery in New York, and didn't happen, but I thought these pictures were so... What a funny old idea. Just a great looking, gorgeous, gorgeous photograph. Um, also at... Um, longer ago, uh, you get to PhotoFest and the room always talks and I asked someone who's good, who's got a good book, and Somebody says, get the Dutch guy. So I went to the five minutes guy, the guy that is in the room and says, five minutes. Portfolio's got five minutes to go. And so I go to him and I go like, can you send me the Dutch guy? Next day, portfolio's all done. And I look up and there's this man who's an adult. And he says, I'm the Dutch guy. <laughs> And he showed these pictures that were Van Dyck's and uh, cyanotype prints. They, he retired from another career 
and he has started making these self-portraits in his attic that are these expiations of guilt for having survived the resistance, the Dutch resistance during World War II. So it's a really complicated mindset. I thought these pictures were, they really resonated with me. And I made the comment later that it was as if Samuel Beckett was doing self-portraits in, photo in photography, which I thought was a pretty good assessment and pretty good praise. So that's Jan. And this is a, this is a guy I saw at a uh, Perry photo a couple years ago, he's German. This is every color. He pixelated every color in the spectrum. So he's the most analytical, it's the most analytical technical approach to photography. And I thought this picture was ravishing. I don't know what he's doing, he's still working and stuff, but this was my favorite picture for like three years. And here's a new boy, here's a young boy. Daniel Costa Garcia, who's English, and uh, he's a finalist in the W. Eugene Smith Memorial Fund grant that I was the head judge for this year. And of all the pictures I saw, this guy's telling a story about migration, Africans into Italy, and he was, a lot of people are telling that story, telling it well, but his pictures were really good looking, and I suspect you'll hear a lot of good things from him. And he's a really, really genuinely sweet fellow. And, oh look what they did here. Isn't that cool? They said thank you, so thank you. So, now, Oh no, no questions. No, I'm not doing questions. No, Christoph obviously isn't here, so let's do questions. Any questions? Oh, he is? Are you in the dark, Christoph? So, does anybody have a, are they just itching with a question? Yes, Stephen. You talked about what you've seen recently. You talked about what you've seen recently. Yeah. What were your What were your gateway drugs into photography? I think we'd love to hear just that. God, also. what a What a good question. So I come into this as a collector. Anyone Anyone in the Western Hemisphere is visually literate, simply because they've seen so many pictures. You just see pictures, see photographs all the time. So. I tell people that the voices told me to go out and buy a photograph. And buy a photograph of a woman whose eyes are closed with a veil. <laughs> it was a very specific voice. I've, I've refined the voice so that now it's actually a bird on my shoulder that I sort of consult with. So for reasons that I still do not begin to comprehend. I was driven to go to an auction one day in the hopes that they would have a photograph that I might like. Lo and behold, this Imogene Cunningham came up at an auction and I went, that's it. And so I was a just dead broke actor who did have a, uh, who bought, I bought this picture for $325, not having a clue where I was gonna find $325. But collectors, they always find the money, one way or another. So I bought that picture, and I thought, man, that's the craziest thing you've ever done. But intense and full and fun. So like any good drug addict, I said, maybe I could do this again. So, you know, 100 years ago in New York, you could see every photograph in about two hours. You could go to three galleries, go to the Museum of Modern Art, and you would, or go to an auction. And, and gradually I built up this collection of pictures of people where you can't see their eyes. And somehow that 
became a cottage industry of talking about pictures and teaching and showing up at events like this and being sort of forceful and hopefully charming and trying to make things happen to talk about pictures. So thank you for the question. So that's not really an answer, but that is an answer. So uh, I'm very happy to welcome Christoph Kandrowitz, who lives in Poland. And he works harder than any 18 people I know. He, he curates the Woj Photo Festival. That's L-O-D-Z, Woj, because my Polish pronunciation is so extraordinary. I like my Dutch pronunciations and my Iranian pronunciation. And then he does the Hamburg Triennial. And is a good guy. He's got the two boats down in the harbor if you want to go see the boats. And um, so I'm going back to Hamburg this year to do something for Christoph. And I'm happy to recognize him. You were very sweet. Thank you very much. We'll do questions later. So.